like to first thank the Tri-State Bridges Federation, and of course, uh, all of you for coming here on this beautiful Saturday so that we can study a little bit more about spiritism and see what we can do to improve our lives. So welcome now to the third and last lecture of, our, of this series, What is Our Destiny? A Part of the Missing Answers uh, Lectures. And when we look at the title already, What is Our Destiny? The first thing that springs to mind is the word destiny. And almost immediately what we see is that we become divided into at least two major large groups. And we're going to discuss about the major groups, not the small ones, okay? There will be those of us who think, for instance, that we come to this world and there is already a predetermined plan that we have to carry out. And that's all there is. We cannot do anything else. There is this, uh, this plan, this schedule, and all we have to do is just fulfill it, carry it out. That's it. So it's like a deterministic, almost fatalistic approach to life. The other type is the skeptics. Uh, no, it's, it's the other group is composed uh, primarily by skeptics. Those who say, no, destiny has always something to say about the near future. There's always something related to near or even a uh, no, far, far away future. And we cannot predict that. Well, there is a little bit of truth in both approaches, but they are both very, uh, very systematic, very dogmatic in their beliefs. And the truth, the real truth, in, uh, is actually more to, uh, between the two of them. And let us take an example so we can better understand this. Imagine that you are at the top of a hill and you're wearing binoculars, all right? And you're at the top of this hill and there's only one road that leads to the top of this hill, all right? This, ro this road winds around the, this hill all the way to the top. And then you know that at a particular point in this road, there's a very sharp bend, it's a very sharp curve. And right after that curve, okay, there is a hole, a big hole. So that if you're driving, you don't have much choice, you have to stop. So now imagine that you are at the top of this, of, of the, of this hill and you have your binoculars, you're looking down, right, trying to figure out where, uh, uh, what, who is coming uh, up this road and you see a car coming, and this car is just before this bend, this very sharp curve. So you may uh, ask yourself, will the car be able to stop in time when you know, the driver sees the hole in the, in the road? Will, be able, will the driver attempt, for instance, to uh, swerve, to veer off? And the, then the driver may have a few options. The driver may, for instance, swerve to the right and hit the wall that makes the hill or the driver may go into the cliff to the left, all right, and go back to the valley where he came, or he or she came from, right? Or the driver might just go right inside the hole. So there are many outcomes. And you are right there at the very top of this hill, and you're looking at the, all these possibilities, possibilities, outcomes. If we were mathematicians, we would say, okay, we can calculate a probability for each one of these outcomes to, uh, to come to life. So we would say maybe the probability that the car will stop before going to the hole is this much, 90% or 60%. It doesn't matter what the value is. What is most important for us to understand is that there are outcomes. And the truth is, no matter how many outcomes we figure out or no matter how much we understand of the situation, you will never be able to say this particular outcome here will happen at 100% certainty. So what do we do in, in, in this case? Well, we try to figure out uh, the conditions. We try to gather information from this situation. We think about, is the car a new car or not? Is the brake system in good shape or not? How well is the driver, you know, as a driver? How well is the person as a driver? Does that person have enough experience and so on? So we look at it, and when we're looking at it from with our binoculars, we see how fast it's approaching. But it doesn't matter how much information we collect from this particular situation, we'll never be able to say with 100% certainty that one of the outcomes will happen against all the other uh, odds or against all the other outcomes. This is exactly what we do with life. We always gather information. 
we are constantly, like Federico said very well, we are constantly experiencing and experimenting with the world around us. And we are gathering information, gathering information that allows us then to make certain inferences, to make certain projections of outcomes in our lives. We can go to another example. Because one, one, one of you might say, okay, if I cannot say for, for sure, with 100% certainty, that this outcome is going to happen, well, then that's it. I'm just proving the point of those who believe that everything is determined or predetermined in our lives. But it's not like that. Think about our careers, whether you, know, you plan to go to college or you just plan to go to a technical school. You had certain expectations of the future life, near future, sometimes 10 or 20 years ahead. And you made plans. All of us, we not only made, we continuously make new plans in our lives. And all these plans are outcomes. We never, will never be able to say for sure today that whatever I'm planning in five years' time will actually be happening, or at least be happening the exact same way that I planned initially. But the point is that we can do that. And what is it that we do? This is the part that we let the other two lectures put together, right? How important it is for us to understand that we need to gather information from our past lives and from this life. So the past, where we came from, and also today, this current life, what we are doing here. Because these, uh, this idea, all the information that we collect from our past experiences allow us, all this, all this group, this set of information allows us to make choices or to make plans that are feasible, that are practical, right? So I can plan something for my future based on what I am today and what I have been so far in my life with all my reincarnations. This is very important. Imagine, at my height, today, at my age, and with my uh, current fitness level, that I would decide to be a professional basketball player. That would be unrealistic. If this is what I mean. We have to be realistic with our plans. But the important thing is, one, number one, that we can collect information and transform that information into a plan. The plans are feasible, okay? That's the very, very uh, and most important uh, point. And the other thing is that along the way, we make little tweaks here and there in our plans because we are collecting information as we go along with that original plan. So in that sense, already, we get rid of this idea of predetermined, predetermined tasks that we have to carry out. So this, this destiny is something that we build as opposed to something that we come with a piece of paper and say, okay, I have to fulfill this one, let me put a tick mark on it. Then second item, put another tick mark and so on. But then we also contradict those skeptics that say, that say, for instance, no, you can never plan anything. Of course we can. Our careers are one of them. Our families are one of them. They might not have turned out exactly what we wanted or are even friendships, everything we do. But there was a plan. You never go into a relationship, friend, with a husband, wife, it doesn't matter what it is without having expectations of yourself, of the others. And in the process, you learn and you change your ideas. But there is always a plan. And the reason why there is always a plan is because we are not mere automatons. We have and we evolve from the principle of intelligence, the intelligent principle. And that intelligent principle is constantly changing in us. Okay? It's an attribute of our spirit, of what defines us. This intelligent principle is in a constant uh, flux. It's in a constant way of changing, a process of changing, of developing, of progressing. And to be able to progress, to be able to change, we have to have interaction. Interaction with this world, interaction with the spiritual world, interaction with you know, among ourselves, because it's from these interactions that we put to the test our, our already consolidated ideas, and we 
see if they really pan out or if we have to change them. And when we gather new information, new ideas, and new uh, experiences in life. This is very important. It has always been happening. And we can look at this as an actually a consequence of the law of progress. All of us, because of the presence of the intelligent principle, have, all of us without exception, this urge to progress. Sometimes we don't know how to express it. And we end up expressing it in not so not such a positive or constructive way. But the point is, we all have it. And it's just a question of finding our balance and figuring it out. And then we'll be able to use it more constructively. And for that, what we need to create is awareness. And here, I make an, an example with all the things that we do in our daily lives. We always have this idea that, oh, so if I make a choice, right, uh, what is it then? Well. The choices in our lives are not good and they're not bad either. They are choices. And the reason why they're not good or bad is because you can only say if it was good or bad after the fact. When you are doing it, you don't have all the information to actually evaluate it. Because otherwise you wouldn't make the choice, you would just use the one that is truly the right path. How many times do we say, oh, if I had known this, I wouldn't have done it that way or the other way, or I would have done it the other way. But that's after the fact. Right? So all our choices is we make them with the best amount of information that is available to us at that very moment. But it's not just like that. Oh, okay, I made the choice, not bad, not good, so I keep moving on. No. We know from the law of cause and effect, or others call action and reaction, others call it cause and consequence, that there are consequences to every choice that we make. So where is it? Where is it that we are located in this whole idea? We are located in exactly that point where we own up to our choices. We own up to everything we do. So if it is this outcome, we own up to this outcome. If it is that outcome, we own up to that one. It doesn't matter. And it's in this own in this ability that we have of owning up to the outcomes that we truly progress because we create the awareness in ourselves of that situation. We create an understanding of that situation represented and still represents to us and how that situation can actually move us forward, can actually make us progress and evolve. So we normally say, well, but then what does it mean owning up to it? It means that I have to uh, go through the same process so normally people would say at this point, okay, so let's say if I cause someone hurt or I harm someone, do I have to harm, do I, do I have to be harmed or hurt in the same process? No, that would be nonsensical because there are only two possibilities. Either we, may, we commit or we, uh, let's say, create a situation that harms or hurts somebody else. And in this case, we are the perpetrator of a bad choice. Let's put it this way. And then we have to force the other individual who is now the victim in the future to be the perpetrator, which is what? I mean, we are condemning that individual to do the same to us, number one. And number two, let's say that that individual chooses to do the exact same thing to us that we did now. Well, but then it's a vicious circle, right? It's a vicious circle. Now I am the perpetrator, the other person is the victim. In the future, the victim becomes the perpetrator and I become the victim. So we're just alternating roles and no one learns anything from it. So that is out of the question. The other possibility, I said there were two, is when I cause person A some harm or I hurt someone. And then we say, okay, that person will move on, let's say. So then a third person has to come in and cause me or the same thing that I did to that person in the first place, the first person. Well, but then, what is it? We are trying to evolve at the expense of the third individual. We are waiting, we, are, we would say, okay, you, you guys, you, this, you came later, uh, so to the whole thing, you came later, so you're the third one, so you're going to have to be the perpetrator. But then where's the end of this whole string of affairs? No, it is the awareness of what we do that really moves us forward. It's the awareness that we have of, uh, of these cause and consequences, but particularly of the consequences of our actions, 
of our thoughts, as Federico put it very well in his lecture, okay? Um, it's all this, actions, words, and thoughts, be the consequences of all these three that allows us to change, but to change when we own up to them. When we say, hmm, yes, that outcome did not come out quite right. Maybe I should change it next time. It is when we do this, when we change ourselves, that we evolve. So the evolution is from within and is outward. Okay? It's not someone telling us what to do or what to say. All right? Or even what to think. And in all this, what we are truly doing is exercising our free will, our ability, actually, this in this case, our capability of making choices. The ability is actually the intelligent principle that we are exercising in the form of intelligence, which is an attribute of our spirit. We are putting this intelligence to use. Use, not good, not bad, but to use. Because if we don't put it to use because we are afraid to commit bad things, it will never evolve, it will stall. You will not involve, but you will not, or devolve, but you will not go any further, it will just stall there. So when we exercise our intelligence, coupled with free will, that is when we change. That is when we project ourselves to a better individual, a better human being, while we have this body, while we're here in, as incarnate individuals. And later, when we go back to the spiritual world, our spirit carries with it all the learning, all the knowledge that we acquired here. The knowledge, not the information, the knowledge. Knowledge is the data, the information put to use, con you know, condensed, associated. So when we move forward, we move because we have put in ourselves something more. We have gathered some more knowledge. We have constructed, built that knowledge. And this is why it's important for us to have this interaction. And we are still doing it. We are no way close to the end of it. And this is, now I'm going to spoil the whole lecture. I'm going to tell you, what is our destiny? Perfection. It was already been said by Heather in her lecture. It was also said by Frederico in his lecture too. Perfection. And it's not that they spoil my lecture. No, because we all know that. We all have it intrinsic, inherently in all, of, in all of us. We have this idea. Are we close to it? No. But what we need to understand is that we can set goals. We can plan our future and set these little goals in life for not the absolute perfection, but at least a relative perfection. Something that says today I'm better than I was yesterday. A year from now I'm better than I'm in, I am today, and so on and so forth. And we can see that everything in our lives are still like that. Progress, evolution. Let us think about, for instance, another example. Let us think of the sun. The sun has been shining for five billion years. It was shining even before the earth was put together. It was shining before even we came to this planet, right? Then eventually we came to this planet, we acquired a, some sort of awareness, and we start looking at that sun, and we start having ideas about that sun. Some thought that the sun was in a chariot, was just a ball of fire in a chariot that crossed the sky from one end to the other, and then at night was put out by the waters in the ocean. Others thought it was a cauldron, a boiling cauldron, okay? Others were just a fire in the sky, or a coin, an incandescent coin. Today, we know the sun is a star, made of helium, made of hydrogen, basically, and then helium, and so on, converting hydrogen into helium, and we don't have to go into the scientific points of it. But the important thing is, our perception of the sun has been changing throughout time. And yet, the sun has been shining the same way it did five billion years ago and will continue to shine for another four to five, barring any other cosmological mishap, okay? But the point is, the sun that is not concerned with our perception of it. Now, when we extrapolate this particular example to the idea that we have of creator and creation, we see the same phenomenon we see that we are evolving our idea of the creator. And if we are evolving our idea of the creator, I hope that I will be able to tell you that we are also evolving our idea of perfection. 
So when we first came to this planet, we were ignorant, very simple. We are actually just gathering fruits. We, don't, we, we, uh, we did not even know how to pursue an animal, right? Everything frightened us, everything. So everything that was unknown to us and you know, we cannot explain, uh, uh, unexplainable, we, what we did, we actually thought, okay, there is a divine concept to it. There is a, a divine attribute. Those were our first gods. So our first idea of a creator was based on fear and ignorance. It was evolved, evolved, and one day, one of us decided to pick up that piece of the piece of, of a tree, a branch, that was on fire. And that brought the fire to the tribe. And that person itself became the god. So now you have a god that is more related to ourselves, right? That has a flesh, has bones, like us. And then we move from this idea of a god that is just out of ignorance and fear from one of power. So that now becomes the, the chieftain or the tribe, lead, the tribe, uh, the leader of the tribe. Okay, I know this is very simplistic, but it evolves in that way. Okay, but eventually someone realized one thing. All right, that guy dies the same way that I do, and the only reason that he is the chieftain is because he holds a piece of branch that has fire at the other end. So. What is wrong with this idea? Okay, so then that guy cannot be God because it, he, that person, he or she also dies like I do. He or she also goes through the same vicissitudes and difficulties in life that I do. So what is so special? Just because he's holding a stick, like a, a big match in one of his hands or her hands? So then we move the idea that is no longer power directly, but an indirect power. We move it to the idea of a representative of a divinity. So now that individual is not really God itself or the creator itself, but is a representation of that. And we keep evolving, evolving, and eventually we start explaining things. All those things that we could not explain before, the, the, the moon in the sky at night, the sun in, during the day, the stars, we start explaining them, and they move away from the point of being divine, from the point of having divine attributes to simple facts of life. We are doing this, in, the, in this case, what we are doing is basically reserving the divine attributes, no longer just for things that we fear, no longer for the things that we ignore, no longer for the, the purposes of power or representative of power, but now we are moving this idea towards things that we I cannot explain right now. There are extra neural, that are extra physical or metaphysical. So this is when we get the concept, the abstract concept of creator. And where does what what does that have to do with destiny? Because once we understand what creator and creation are, we can understand the concept of perfection or at least begin to. Because the truth is, at our current level of understanding, We'll never be able to get a full view, a full grasp of these concepts. So now we have these entities, these objects are all abstract. They represent, you know, for instance, the Greek gods were like that. There was the god of envy, there was the god of malice, there was the go god of goodness, and all, so on. All these are abstract concepts. But then one thing happened. We look at them and we realize, now I have two gods here, okay? These are no longer physical entities. They are now two abstract entities. But now, for me to say that this is different than that, in other words, for me to say that this is an individual or has an individualization compared to this one, this has to have something that this one doesn't have. This one also has to have something that this one doesn't have, right? Otherwise, it would be one and the same thing, one and the same concept. So the only way that they have to be individuals or to have to individualization is if they have something that the other one doesn't. But now if this one has something that this one doesn't have, it, this is not complete. So it cannot be a god. Then I take this one and I compare it to a third one over here. Now this one lacks something that this one has. So then this one cannot be a god either. And I keep going on and on and on with this process and I arrive at something, at a concept that is now everything, that has everything, the concept of the creator, unique. So as you can see, moving towards one creator wasn't an administrative decision, 
was a rational thinking. It was logical thinking. And not only that, now that we have this idea of the creation of a unique creator, not, uh, not creation, I'm sorry, but a unique creator, we also have another idea that comes as a consequence of it. This creator cannot have a beginning, and it cannot have an end. Because if he has a beginning, then there must have been something before that. And it means that if it had a beginning, it also had to evolve like we do. And if it has to evolve, then it wasn't perfect. So the only way that this can be a single abstract concept and the idea of perfection, absolute perfection, untrue, unconditional love, absolute justice, is if that has always been there, whatever it is. Today, we cannot put our, we cannot wrap our minds around this. This is too complex. But at least we accept these attributes. We don't understand the creator, but we try to approach it by its attributes. And perfection, our destiny, is one of them. This is what ties everything together. It's what our future has for us. Our ways in our life, uh, how we interact with each other, how we experience, how we experiment with the world is what polishes, is what increases our uh, ability to move even further, to progress, to develop. It is this progress, this development, that allow us to have an even better idea of the Creator with every passing day. And this is where Spiritism can assist us. Since Spiritism is based, is solidly, uh, you know, is solidly founded on three major pillars, okay? Science, religion, and philosophy. All three contribute for our understanding, or our, our, a better understanding of our world. The philosophy is the part that tells us, hey, do not be afraid. Question, inquire, ask, analyze, go for it. Try to find an answer. That is what the philosophy is telling us. It is allowing us to pursue our curiosity that comes naturally from that law of progress. That is the consequence of our creation, of our existence as individuals. And it's telling us, go for it. Do not be afraid of question. It moves us away from dogmas. It moves us away from absolute truth that are never absolute because we don't even know what the truth really is. We are pursuing it. How can you say you have it if you're still pursuing it? If you already have it, then you're not pursuing. You already have, have it. It's already there. So if you are pers pers per, uh, pursuing it, it means that it's already, it's a progress. It's something that is happening in development, under development. Okay, so this is the, what the philosophical part tells us. It says to us, listen, tradition is a beautiful thing. But tradition is not there to hold you back. Tradition is there to be respected. Tradition is there to make you understand where you came from. Heather's first uh, lecture that put it very clearly to us. That, that tradition is all our past lives, what we have been, what we were, and still, and still are in some ways. So tradition is to be respected, but not to stall us, not to detain our progress. But then, philosoph philosophy is not enough, because it tells us, go, investigate, ask, inquire, but how? We need a method, we need an approach, which is what we get from the scientific view of, from the scientific view of spiritism. It ties the philosophical need for answers, urge for questioning, to something that says, okay, you want to, you want to ask questions, fine, but you also have to make the experiments. You have to do the experiment, carry them out, do it, collect the data, amass the data, and then think about it. Go back to the philosophy and then allow yourselves to debate the, the, all this information that you collect. And then you ask, okay, where's the religion in all this? Well, the religion is what makes the scientific approach worth doing. It's what tells you, okay, go for it, ask, but have in mind a goal. That goal is this absolute perfection. It's what we call faith, simply because we don't understand what absolute perfection is. So we have difficulty defining the goal. When we don't define the goal, even what we call it might be any name, it doesn't really matter. 
we don't have that definition, so it's very difficult for us to understand. So what we say to ourselves is this, have faith. Have faith that this is what you're going to build to create for yourself. Because this is what you're go you want to do one day. You, won't be a you want to be able to understand who, whom you are, who you are and where you are and why you're here, right? So it's this, this, uh, this intricate mechanism of religion, of philosophy, and of science that allows us to move forward. The, religion, the religious part also tells science, it keeps science in a, in a very tight leash. Don't let it derail into materialism. Because if we derail into materialism, eventually we'll just say, okay, I am the product of my genes, or even worse, I'm the product of the atoms that, build, uh, uh, that compose my body. And then where is my responsibility? Where is the owning up to my, my choices? Well, in the first place, where are the choices, right? If I am just the product of something else and I have no saying, I never made any choice. The choices were listed for me to make. So this is why we need also the religious component. And this is something that's very difficult. The very first thing that people ask when they, they start at least listening about spiritism or they come to one of the uh, spiritist uh, centers and they, they attend a meeting is, oh, do I have to abandon my religion? Or spiritism. Spiritism is not a, re a religion. Spiritism doesn't ask you to abandon re religion. What a spiritism actually does is warn you and actually in it invites you to reevaluate, okay, your religious beliefs. In the sense, put away the ritualism. Go back to the core of your religion because all the religions have a beautiful core. The core that leads us to the perfection, our destiny. The core that leads to this creator creation thing. The core that talks about unconditional love. Everything else is clothing, it's declaration that we have put through thousands of years. And today, we give more importance to those things, to the ritualistic part of, of our religions, than to the core, to the religious core. Spiritism is telling us, okay, forget about the ritualism. Let's go back. Let us revive what you once had that was in a pure state and that you, for some reason, corrupted out of ignorance. Let's put it in a very constructive way. So no, you're not abandoning your religious beliefs. You are reviving them, reviving now with the ability that you have to debate, to discuss, to analyze with the scientific and the philosophical parts. And also by looking at the religious components, say, okay, now I can follow this without being held back by dogmas or by truth that nobody can question. Because we are always evolving. It is our perception of the world that is evolving. We polish this perception with every single step in our lives. Every single step with every reincarnation, every incarnation process that we go through. And just to finish, I want to show you something. I'm presenting to you here a picture of a statue that was sculpted by uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti, an Italian, okay, from the Renaissance. This is the Pietà. Pietà is a very general name, okay? Now, it's not here for its religious implications, and it's not here also for us to discuss it uh, in terms of art. I am not competent to do that. What I want you to see there is the sheer beauty of the lines, of the traces. This statue was put together in two years by Michelangelo, 1498 to th through, through 1499. So whenever you ask scholars of art, they say, yes, it was, it was started, it started to be sculpted in 1498 and it was ended in 1499. So I ask you, do you really know when Michelangelo finished this sculpture? That was even before he ordered the marble. The sculpture was absolutely finished in his mind as a thought process. He had sculpted it, he had polished it, and he had also cleaned it. He had already seen this even before he ordered the marble or picked up the chisel to sculpt it. Because to believe otherwise, to believe that Michelangelo actually got this marble and starts sculpting randomly and arrive at this, is to remove his merit as an artist. Is to believe that a monkey at a typewriter eventually will type Hamlet 
or any other beautiful piece of work that we know of. No, it had to be ready in his mind. So when he had this ready in his mind, he had the future in his mind. And then the only thing that he had to do is bring that future to the present. Why is that? Because unfortunately the others do not know how to read minds as we still don't. So he had to conceptualize it on a physical medium. He had to give it physicality, express that beautiful thought of these beautiful lines of this, this magnificent piece of work onto a physical medium. He chose the marble. The medium doesn't matter. Okay? But what is important is he made something that was dry, cold, a piece of stone. And mind you, not one of the most uh, important stones we have on earth, okay? or not even one of the most uh, hard. All right? But he made it into this beauty. This is what we all can do. Express this beauty that is already within us in our thought patterns, in our everyday lives, by interacting, by putting ourselves to work, to have the effort to do so. We are not asking anyone to be a sculptor. This is one way that we have of expressing what goes inside of us. There are many other ways. Some, go by, some, is, uh, some people will express themselves through music. Some will express themselves through teaching. Some through patience. The point is the medium doesn't matter. What matters is that we put what is already in us, but is the future for others, on a physical form or on a form that others can also appreciate. Not only for us to be able to see the result of our own effort and progress, but also to, for others to see as an encouragement, as a motivation towards this absolute perfection that is next to the Creator. Right now, we can only use as a goal relative perfection. We cannot go any further than that. But I would say that when he sculpted that, he was very close to that relative perfection at that point in his development in life. And who knows, if 500, more than 500 years ago, he could put this together. Imagine what, it, what doesn't go through his mind as a spirit today in terms of beauty. We all have that. We can all put that having this idea of perfection as the goal, as our destiny. And we have spiritism as an immense, as a magnificent tool. It is a tool, like the chisel. So let us take spiritism, let us take this chisel and sculpt the marble of creation with our own beautiful ideas that are already in our thoughts for others to see, for others to feel motivated so that we, as a collective, as a humanity, can also evolve, also progress towards this destiny of all of us, without exception, which is perfection. Thank you.